Good morning from the garden. My name is Vera Gröting. I'm a permaculture gardener, teacher and author. And today I would like to take you on a little tour of our quarter acre food forest. It's the last week of May and some exciting things are happening here. The herb layer is developing beautifully. The trees are setting lots of fruit and we even have some first berries. And I would like to share this moment in time with you. This morning I watched a video that we filmed in the garden in April last year and the changes are quite astonishing. So I'll put the link in the description box below to that video so that you can watch it too if you're interested. This video is going to be quite random and unscripted and I would just like to take you around and point out some interesting things. So I hope you'll enjoy it. Let's start here. This area is where we had our hugel bed that we dismantled in the spring in February. Yeah, it was my husband's birthday in February last year. And I filmed a video about that. So if you want the details, go back and watch that too. I think it's rather interesting. We spread out the half composted wood over here. We covered that in with cardboard to kill perennial weeds and we grew winter squash here. That uh, did very nicely for us. We harvested over 60 kilo of winter squash. This year uh, the area is pretty much clear of uh, perennial weeds but I decided to still grow winter squash here uh, while I'm deciding how I want to plant it. I want to take my time and really think about how I want to develop this area. Um, what I did was spread out wood chip around here and then plant out winter squash, different varieties of butternut and hubbard. And maybe you can point down a little. What I'm doing is uh, giving the plants, individual plants, mulch of coffee grounds because those uh, can help to deter slugs which might find a good habitat in the um, in the woodshed. So far they don't seem to be getting any damage at all so I'm hopeful and I think that I'm not giving them any additional uh, feed because uh, the soil here thanks to the decomposted wood is really rich and good. Another thing I want to share is uh, this apple tree that was previously growing in the hugel bed and I replanted it. I moved it here in February last year. Um, it's on a dwarf, uh, dwarfing root, uh, dwarf rootstock and it is topaz, which is one of the best uh, scab resistant varieties on the market. Last year I did not let it uh, bear any fruits because uh, the tree needed all its energy <laughs> to to deal with the shock of the replanting but it's growing really nicely so this year I'm letting it to uh, I'm leaving a few of the fruits on the tree I did thin them so there'll be just a few but they're looking beautiful and I'm looking forward to tasting them in the fall and now let's look at the part of the garden that's a bit older it was planted I think by now three four years ago um, we have a plum tree here that's also setting fruit. We have a cranberry here, also lots of fruit on it. It flowered beautifully. I really love the clove scented flowers of that one. Here's a little card, little, quite a large cardoon. And I think the most beautiful plant at the moment is uh, chives over here. That's a plant that I struggled to grow successfully in the past and because I love chives I wanted to have lots of them. So I separated the clumps I had and I planted them in two different areas. Both are doing great. So we're harvesting lots of chives now. And um, in permaculture it's important that things have multiple functions. Chives besides being an edible plant of course uh, because it's in the onion family it also has um, antibacterial anti what is it called um, and <laughs> antifungal properties so i think that's beneficial for fruit trees so i like to plant them close to fruit trees and besides that it's also a great um, uh, great plant for bees Here's another area of the garden with a pear tree on one side and an apple tree behind me. This one is also a scab resistant variety called Ecolette, but that one already gave us a 
pretty good harvest last year because you can also see the tree is a is a half standard so it's on a, a more vigorously growing rootstock it will be larger than the other one the, the first one i showed you ever will uh, and that also means that it will give us better harvest overall um, this area was only planted i start only started planting last year i think and um, there are again things like perennial onions. Everything that I said about the chives is true for those two. They're beneficial for fruit trees and a good pollinator plant. Um, then there are things like sea beet, which is a perennial sort of um, chart, perennial family or ancestor of chart and beets. Uh, here's a, a ornamental sage that's also a great pollinator plant. Uh, this is a white currant on a rootstock that I was talking about in the previous video about planting it and hoping it would recover because it was left in the pot uh, in the container too long, but uh, it's growing nicely. What else do we have here? Uh, lemon balm and bee balm that will flower later. And over here is a perennial kale. The planting in this area is more uh, our, no, I don't want to step on anything. <laughs> the plants in this area require a bit more sunshine, but because they're on the southern side of the tall trees, um, they do get quite a bit of sunshine. So it's also something that you have to consider when designing the herb layer, uh, how much sunshine the plants require and you have to develop the area accordingly. So now let me take you to the part behind the trees that gets very little sunshine and um, show you what plants can thrive in, what edible plants can thrive in partial shade. So now I'm on the north side of the apple tree and you can see the difference in light levels. Uh, this part of the garden will get some sunshine in the afternoon but there are parts of it here under the large hazelnut tree that are pretty much in shade the whole day um, so again the planting is uh, uh, developed accordingly i have two currant bushes this is a pink one called rosa sport there's a white one over here this is citavia i think uh, i have gooseberry and all these bushes are woodland edge plants so they will do well on the edges of a food forest in part shade and they will fruit well even with quite a lot of shade though the fruit will be sweeter if they get some sunshine and then we have some again in the in the herb layer this is the second patch of chives that i have that are flowering beautifully now um, and now i can't remember the name I'll put, uh, I will put the English name in the, on the screen. Uh, this is one of my favorite perennial salad plants. It has slightly cucumber-like uh, fla cucumber flavored leaves. And also it's a good pollinator plant. Then we have sweet Sicily with very nice uh, aniseed-like flavor. Um, if you go back to the video that we filmed last year, you'll see how small the plants were and how beautifully they grew. Then behind the sweet Sic Sicily, we have hosta, which is uh, one of my favorite perennial vegetables. And if you'd like to know more about how to use it, go back to my video on 10 perennial vegetables that we grow. Over here, I have um, sorrel. This variety is called the Belleville and it's one of the nicest tasting ones, I think. Uh, you can see it's going to seed. This is pretty much the end of the um, harvest period. Most of the perennial vegetables are especially useful in early spring. And now let me show you the first berries that ripen in our food forest. So the first berries that ripen in our food forest, even before the first strawberries, are honey berries. I have a video that gives you all the information you need for growing honey berries, so I will not go into detail. But in that video I was talking about these three bushes that I was planting and talking about the varieties and why I chose them. So it might also be interesting to see how much the berries, uh, the bushes have grown. I planted them three years ago 
and they're putting I, I think that like the first two years they were not growing that much but you can see now they're really putting on a lot of growth and they're giving us a pretty good harvest uh, the one that is fruiting the most abundantly is uh, uh, boreal beauty over here which also has some of the largest fruits they're slightly uh, heart shaped and they have a really good taste I've been thinking about how to describe the flavor and I think it's something between wild um, blueberries but then the European blueberries not the American North American ones and maybe with a hint of strawberry as well but there's a big difference in the varieties so if you're choosing honeyberries for your garden um, do take the time to source out really good varieties um, the troublesome thing of the, the tricky thing with uh, honeyberries is that they will turn dark blue some week or up to two weeks I think before they're fully they're actually fully ripe um, one hint as to the ripeness is that they start falling from the tree so once you start finding berries under the bush you know uh, they're ripe Right behind the honeyberries are our two popo trees. Uh, this one that was larger already when I planted it and then uh, this one. Popos again, um, the same with honeyberries, you need several varieties for good pollination. And those are uh, compatible. Um, the trees also finally started growing and even flowered for the first time. But the trouble is only this one flowered uh, this one didn't, so we didn't get any pollination and we didn't get any fruits. It's not a problem, the trees are still young, so I'm giving them time to uh, mature a bit, uh, to be able to bear the fruit, which are very large and heavy. Another plant that seems to be taking a lot of time to find its footing is the Shisandra over here on our pergola. Again, um, there's a pollination problem or concern. Uh, most of the varieties of Shisandra are not uh, self-pollinating, self-fertile. Uh, there is one um, on the market here that's called Sodova 5, which I planted over here. But look at how uh, little it's growing, because this has been planted, I think about four years ago. The other one over here also took a long time. I think it only started shooting up and really going uh, up the pergola last year it even flowered it has beautiful flowers but again because there was no cross-pollination we don't get fruits yet i hope this one will also make up its mind and start growing up and then maybe hopefully fingers crossed how do you cry <laughs> we'll we'll get some fruits next year and i will of course share that with you we have many different climbers along our long pergola and again the planting was designed in such a way that it is adapted to the light levels that are available. This part is the most uh, uh, shaded ones because it's behind the hazelnut tree and Shisandra is one of the edible perennials that can take that. But uh, um, there are parts of the pergola that get a little more sun. Over there we're growing uh, grapes and uh, hardy kiwis. And then there's the area in between that gets uh, part sun or part sun, some of the day and in that area we're growing hybrid berries. So in the area of the pergola that gets some sun uh, during a part of the day, we're growing berries like uh, boysenberry, loganberry, thaiberry, and we have uh, black raspberries over there. I have a detailed video uh, about these if you're interested. Um, this is a Japanese wineberry and uh, blackberry, thornless blackberry and all these um, uh, unlike uh, Shisandra or uh, the Stoutonia that we have over there are fruiting reliably from year two. There are other fruiting plants that can take quite a bit of shade or are even happier in part shade. One of them is Chinese dogwood and uh, since it's flowering now it is at its most beautiful it is usually, uh, in Europe at least, planted as an ornamental. So this is a perfect bush for 
ornamental edible garden. Um, it will get edible fruits in fall, so I'll try to film a video then and talk a bit about the taste, but right now we're just enjoying the flowers. So that was a little update on our food forest garden. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give the video a thumbs up. Uh, but for the long time viewers, I would also like to give you a little personal update or maybe new viewers as well, whoever's interested. Um, the reason that we're not filming very many videos is that um, filming a video takes quite a bit of time. It can take up to two days or more of my time and uh, YouTube is not my work. I am not getting any income from YouTube because Google has uh, blocked our ad revenue without explanation. So there's also not really hope that we'll, this situation will change. And that means that other work, paid work, has to take precedence. I'm currently teaching quite a lot. I'm giving lectures and teaching courses that I'm very much enjoying because it has not been possible for the past two years. Um, Beside that, I have designed two edible borders and two raised beds at the Floriade Expo, which are filled with edibles. And we filmed a short video about that last week. We're going back there again tomorrow to plant the last uh, uh, fruiting bushes in the borders. And I hope to film a video about one of the raised beds, which is full of perennial veggies. And beside that, I'm working on my next book, uh, which is very exciting, uh, but um, a little hard to fit into uh, in between the gardening and working at the moment so but I will get back to working on that more intently um, later in the year I hope. We'll try to film as many videos as we can the rest of the season because we really do enjoy making them and sharing the garden with you but in the meantime if you're missing your grown to cook fix you can go back and watch the many videos in the archives or you can order my book Edible Paradise if you'd like to support the channel in another way. Until next time, happy gardening!